I remember this thing that came into my head, this thought. He's immortal. It's, nothing's going to get this way. But that immortal thing became something else, didn't it? I was looking for the word, what it is today to be. Looking back at that many years, now 50 of them, at this boy, at that year. Um, sobering, maybe. And yet, <laughs> I guess I've gotten used to the fact that there is a huge meaning for so many people to his life and his work. One of the things that you should remember about the 50s, while it had uh, the blacklist and the whole McCarthy thing, to counterbalance that, the horror of that period was the fact that, that the 50s in New York was like the Renaissance. It was spectacular. They were real heroes. You could go to 52nd Street and, and listen to Art Tatum or, or Charlie Parker or Miles Davis and club after club after club. And on Broadway was, was Marlin and Streetcar and, uh, and Death of a Salesman. So there was a sense of passion. There was stimulation. New York was a thrilling place in the 50s. Very romantic as well. Every actor was there, you know. I remember sitting in Cromwell Drugstore, you know, in the NBC building, sitting with Jimmy and, and Marty Landau. You know, uh, we all were vying for jobs, but there was a kind of camaraderie. We did it Jimmy represented something at that moment in time. Uh, he became an icon. Up until that moment, grown-ups had styles and fashions, music, clothing. After World War II, a different kind of thing started happening when the young men came back from the war who survived it. A different kind of animal that represented unrest and dissatisfaction with the status quo. And Jimmy's early television work and his movies, all three movies, represented a young American who was not happy with his lot and the way things were. Uh, we have with us, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ilya Kazan, who produced and directed East of Eden. And when you see it, you These are it. Ilya Kazan's notes on the character Cal from a movie he was about to direct called East of Eden. Here are the notes. Everything this kid does should be delightfully anarchistic, odd, original, imaginatively eccentric, and full of longing. He is the unexpected personified. He goes directly to the heart of the matter. And aside by me, it seemed this was perfect casting for the young boy, James D. There he was. And I had an intuition. I said, this is Cal. This is, this is the guy right here. He, uh, he did a thing that always attracts me. He wasn't polite to me. And that always sort of makes me feel he's not not training to butter, you know, to butter me up right like that. He has a real, uh, a real sense of himself. Oh, he said, I'll take you for a ride in my motorbike, which is, he was, it was very hard for him to talk, and riding me on the back of his motorbike, which I did like on the streets of New York, was his way of communicating with me, of saying, well, I hope you like me, or look at my skills, or whatever. So then, so <laughs> he had his own, you saw what he's like, he had his own way, and, uh, I thought it was perfect for the part. I mean, I, I, I thought it was an extreme grotesque of a boy. I thought it was a twisted boy. And I thought, twisted by the denial of love. And it turned out, as I got to know his father and I got to know about his family, that he had been, in fact, twisted by the denial of love. 
love rejected. That, that's all there is to it. But, and here's the genius of Alia Kazan as a director. For the actor, he has to play not the rejection. He has to proffer love, search for love in every form, in every way, at every moment. He is always reaching out. Uh, Jimmy and I met on campus at UCLA. Uh, that was uh, 1950, I think. And um, he was uh, fresh off the farm in Indiana and still smelled a little bit of um, hayseed. So we didn't really connect very well uh, at the beginning. And gradually, this guy began to grow on me. He, he was very, he alternated between being very shy and being very, uh, he was also very needy. It was like he didn't have any real friends. It, it was so clear that he was a special person. Every moment that you spent with him, you knew you were with an original. Strange and peculiar and arresting, and every, you, you, you couldn't take your eyes off him. He was very handsome. <laughs> we would get on his motorcycle and we'd go down on Hollywood and Vine and sit on the, the street benches, watch the night people. That's where we got our characters, he said. And very often we didn't even say anything to each other. You could say Jim was a little moody. Uh, so was I, you know. Uh, a little angry, so was I. A little curious, so was I. A sweet, rustic person. Um, I used to imagine him sitting on a porch in Indiana. I would have, that seemed so present. But on the other hand, there was a suspicious, taut, guarded young man. And both of them seemed always present. Of course, that's a thrilling, a thrilling tension within. He understood pain. Young people usually don't have that kind of pain or don't wear it as externally. Okay. One of the things that made Jim notice was his vulnerability. He understood a mother he didn't have. He didn't really talk much about his mother. She died of cancer over a long period of time when he was nine, nine years old, which had a tremendous impact on him, of course. East of Eden was like a chance to meet his mother again, if one accepts that. Jim, your mother passed away, and it was unfortunate. She left this young boy motherless, and he had to be raised by a father who didn't understand him, and an aunt and uncle on a farm. But we've arranged for you to spend a little time with your mother again. What do you think of that? Wow. There we are. You let me talk to you?